Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is David Talbot. I'm Managing Director and Head of Research at Red Cloud Securities, and I'm delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on uranium today. And we are joined by Labrador Uranium CEO Stephen Keith. Now, during today's webinar, he will provide an overview and outlook. Then we will take some questions, and you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. We'll get to as many as we can. But before we kick things off, we first need to discuss the fine print. During this Labrador Uranium webinar, forward-looking statements may be made. I would direct listeners to the forward-looking statements outlined on page two of the Labrador Uranium uh, presentation, and that can be found on the company's website, labradoruranium.com. For Red Cloud Securities, I'd highlight this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note that this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors, and participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. So please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures on Labrador Uranium. Now, before Stephen steps up, I would like to say a couple of words. Uh, ongoing news from Ukraine and the fear of Russian uranium and enrichment disruption seems to have dissipated a little bit, and sprout buying seems to have slowed down, and there's been downward pressure on the uranium prices. So while uranium started this year at 40 bucks a pound, it surpassed 63 bucks last week, the highest prices have been since March 2011. However, since it has settled back quickly down to about 53 bucks a pound. Now, recent buying from Sprott Physical Uranium Trust has slowed. During the first month of the Ukraine invasion, it had bought 5.5 million pounds. But during the second month, it only bought 2.4 million pounds and now stands at 55.4 million pounds in inventory. So part of the reasoning that uh, the prices have, could co have come off as well could be the fact that the market sees less potential for the, U the U.S. to lose access to up to 40% of its uranium supply. And as such, uranium stocks have been hit. Still up, most of, most of them over the last quarter. Many explorers are off between 50 to 30% over the past month, and most of that coming in the last week. But that said, in, the, in our uranium exploration peer group of 19 stocks, Labrador uranium has pulled back the second least out of all of those 19 stocks over the past week. So to summarize, you know, this market is volatile. It's exasperated due to the narrow demand, largely from physical buying and traders trying to front run that demand. This is also discretionary buying and it's beyond market fundamentals. And reasons for the recent price drop are, are varied, but really investors that believe in the Russian supply disruptions are also investors that can quickly shift positions and the prices could rebound just as quickly as they have dropped. So bottom line, we still like the fundamentals for driving uranium prices higher. And with disinvestment in the uranium sector over the past several years, there's been lack of exploration, lack of discoveries, and new mines will be needed to, over the coming years to replace mine closures, let alone cover the growth in uranium demand. So perhaps current prices over 50 bucks will help. And with that, you know, I'm now going to turn over uh, the, the call to Stephen to update our audience on Labrador Uranium and tell us how he's going to help fill the gap. So, Stephen. Thanks, David. Great introduction. And, and thank you for your time. And uh, it's always good to hear from you. And nice to hear the views on, on, on what's going on in the Uranium market. Obviously, important context for what we're doing. So, uh, I guess I'll start from the beginning. So I'm Stephen Keith, the CEO of Labrador Uranium, and uh, and thank you for your time today. So, you know, you'll see in this presentation, we started at a very high level and we funded it down to the details. So at the very highest level, who are we? We're a district scale target rich exploration company in Labrador. Um, this is a company that was started in the last half of last year. In 2021, we raised about $10 million to get the company going. And then we listed it on the CSC this year in March. So we're, we're just a little over a month old on, on trading. Um, and it, it, there's a pretty exciting opportunity here, which hopefully uh, I can walk you guys through now. Um, as David said, we will be making forward looking statements. And uh, so, you know, always as, as always, I will, I, will, I will gear you towards that page. So who we are. So Labrador Uranium was launched by successful project generators. Everybody on the board and on the team or groups are, are, are individuals who have done this before in, in various in various ways. Um, what happened is in late in, in well, mid 2021, um, 
consolidated uranium, which as their name says, and many of you know, has been buying and growing in the uranium space and adding these assets. And as they have been moving towards more advanced assets um, and, and, and needing to develop those, this ass, there's this one asset that became of great interest to me, which is the Morin Lake project in Labrador, because it didn't quite fit within what they were doing since it needed a lot more exploration and growth. And so we made the determination, let's spin that out of Labrador Uranium and create a new vehicle to focus on this space, but again in Labrador. And the reason why is I'll tell you in a second. So what we did is we spun Morin Lake out of Labrador Uranium, out of Consolidated Uranium, immediately did a deal with Altius Minerals, who... Um, now, for those of you who don't know, this is a basin that has been explored since the 70s, the Central Mineral Belt in Labrador. Um, in the last uranium boom, uh, we saw over $100 million spent in this basin and the discovery of a greater than 100 million pound uranium deposit by Aurora Energy, which is now owned by Paladin. But in the in-between times from the last uranium boom to today, there was this big downturn, both, both in uranium and the ability to explore in this region and people have given up their land. Well, Altius, who is from St. John's, their Newfoundland-based company, got a great track record, went and consolidated the whole basin. So they took on about 125,000 hectares along about 125 kilometer length. And what we did is we did a deal where we took on all of those assets. We had Morin Lake, which has a historical resort, uranium and vanadium resource. We then added to it this massive land package that has been explored for over 50 years with dozens and dozens of not only uranium, but uranium, copper, and gold occurrences. Uh, and then to, to sort of finalize and, and sweeten up the deal, we also did a deal that has not closed. The only piece of the deal that has not closed is, and that's just timing, is with mega uranium, we'll also be buying into their, we'll take, be taking on their two thirds portion of the joint venture from the Mustang Lake project, um, which again is on the Eastern side of the central mineral belt. It is right beside Paladin's 100 million pound deposit um, and does have, uh, known uranium drill intercept. So concept is put all these exploration projects into one single package, which we did. Uh, we built a board around it, a, a fairly strong board, and that board includes uh, Phil Williams, who is the, the CEO of, of Consolidated Uranium, is our chairman. Uh, Richard Patricio, who's the CEO of Mega Uranium, is on the board. And then the third board member is a guy by the name of Justin Reed. Many of you probably know him. He's got a great track record. He was a banker, but also... Uh, has been building companies for years and is, is presently the CEO of Troilus Gold. So we, we, we got the asset package, we brought on a really good governing group to make sure that we were protecting both the company, the strategy, and hopefully in the end, the, the, the money we bring into this. And then we raised just under $10 million in 2021. And that set us up for our success. So we did complete the split out in February, got the listing in March 3rd of last year on the CSC, and now we're up in trading. Uh, and I guess the final piece of information for those that you don't that don't know is about a week ago, uh, we announced a, a bot deal flow through financing through Red Cloud, uh, which should close tomorrow for approximately $10 million. So we're in very good shape financially. We've got an incredible land package. And now now our job is to go and make discoveries. As we sit today, we're sitting on about 47.7 million shares. When we close the combination of the financing as well as that mega deal, which I alluded to earlier, that will add approximately 10 million more shares. So that 47.7 million shares outstanding turns to about 57.7. Um, we are well cashed up. So although at the beginning of the quarter, we had about seven and a half million dollars in cash, there's another almost 10 million coming into the bank account in the next few days. Um, and and it, again, it sets us up in a great situation. We've got a great shareholder group. Um, the majority of both financings, um, our original $8 million financing through Red Cloud plus this one, has been underpinned by long strategic holders, large funds, mostly uranium funds. We've got Altius Minerals, who is both based in the region but knows this space very well at a 16% shareholder. Um, and so, and, and then insiders themselves, we've all bought our own shares that went in and we own about six, six and a half percent of the company. So, you know, a great structure and starting kit for, for what we want to be. So again, from a high level, what are we? We believe we are established company builders, both from a board level, all individuals who have built, run and developed companies. Uh, most of us have also been on, on the buy side or the sell side as bankers or, or investors. Um, we have built an incredible geological team, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. And, uh, and we have experience in, in, in growing companies. 
and which is really important, right? We really do believe that one of the things that we bring to the table is we try to bring a shareholder approach. So it's not me as a PhD geologist trying to build some science experiment that I found years ago. The goal is to make investors money. And so we have to protect that money. We have to listen to our strategy, our, our board and our shareholders, but with a very clear view of finding significant deposits. And that's what we're trying to do. We do believe that this, the central mineral belt is going to be Canada's next great uranium region. Um, we, we have the opportunity here, like with, well, with about 140,000 hectares and dozens and dozens of known occurrences, again, of uranium and copper and that sort of thing, we have many ways to deliver value and to make discoveries in this thing. Within this belt, there are multiple known uh, historical uranium resources including sort of anchoring the eastern end of this belt, Paladin's 120 million pound uh, Michelin deposit. So it's a very rich belt. We know there's stuff there, but it's never been held in a singular company with all of that historical data. And, and we're very excited to start start exploring here. And, and then finally, like the last piece, and you know, last week hasn't been as good, but in general, this is an amazing opportunity and the great timing and, and the tailwinds of the uranium market have been exceptional for us. Look, um, I've done a lot in renewable energy. I've done a lot of mining and, 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 and I'm, I'm a supply and demand guy. That's, all, that's the best I can do. And, and, and I look at this as saying, like, as the EU is declaring nuclear to be a green energy, um, nuclear is the biggest component of, of carbon zero energy in the United States. It's over 50 percent of that, over 20 percent of the U.S. Uh, market. Um, we're seeing these, these different modular reactors go around. The, the growth of, within uranium is going to be incredible, and we're happy to be at what we see to be a relatively early stage of that. You know, I promised you earlier, Chuck, I'm not going to talk about the less side of this field. Like, we can talk about the management and the board, and I did a little bit about that. But, but in the end, our job is to make discoveries. And so what's more important is the right side of this page. I won't talk about all of them, but the, 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 the one guy I will talk about it alludes to our strategy, which is Paul Pearson. So... We've got to make discoveries. Our job is to find a billion, our, our target is to find that billion dollar deposit somewhere in the ground here. But you have to do that through exploration. That being said, this basin has been explored for 50 years by dozens of companies. And again, we've consolidated all that land, but we've also consolidated all that data. Because it's never been in one hand, hand and nobody's ever looked at it from a singular point of view, we have that opportunity. But with that amount of land and with that amount of data, it, it can be very challenging to, to, to zero in on targets. So what we're doing is we're looking at this exploration from two points of view. One is hard on the ground, proper geological exploration, geophysics, drilling, geophysics, drilling, that sort of thing. But as well is on the ground, we've got like on the team, we've built out this team of guys who are experts in machine learning and artificial intelligence. So we've got Paul Pearson, who's a PhD structural geologist on our team. He is our chief geologist. Um, he is our chief geologist and has built AI before. So he and his team won the Guller Prize. It was a challenge set up in Australia to, to use large data over large packages of land to come up with hard exploration targets. And that's what he did successfully. Drew Heisman at the bottom of this table here, director of Geodata, did the same thing with his team here in Canada. He's finishing off his master's right now in geology. And no, sorry, he is already a geologist, but in Geodata with the view towards using modern data focused approach to use large packages of data to, to come up with hard targets. And we believe that, that is one of the most exciting opportunities here. So again, it's not known targets that we have like Warren Lake, which is great, but trying to look for looking through all that historical data and land package to come up with even more exciting targets. And we now have that capability. So as I said earlier, we believe this to be the next great Canadian uranium region. Why? Firstly, Labrador is an amazing place to work. The, the, the Fraser Institute considers Labrador and Newfoundland to be one of the 10 best places to invest in mining in the world. It is a world-class it has world-class large-scale mining projects. You know, you've got Voices Bay up north. You've got those large iron ore projects in the western part of the, of the, of the region. Um, politically, it's stable. We know what the permitting and the laws and the rules are. Uh, and as someone who spent most of his career working in, in developing countries, and which I've loved, I must say working in Canada and especially in Labrador, knowing what all the pieces of the puzzle are, does make my job easier and gives me a lot of comfort knowing what, what, what we can do and build. I won't spend a ton of time on this page. I think David did a better job of it. And, 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 and you know, it, 
it's fundamental to the long term of this, but in the end, uranium's got long legs, as I said earlier. It is it is becoming the best source of, of, of non of carbon neutral energy. It is the only source of base load energy for that. And you know, as someone who's done wind and hydro before, look, run a river hydro, wind and solar are great spaces, but they only generate electricity 30, 35% of the time. And you can't fire industry and you can't fire cities off of that. So what do we do? What does uranium do? Uranium provides that base load without any carbon. So it beats coal, oil, gas, any of those things without the disturbance. And as people bring this on globally and in different jurisdictions and regulatory environments and governments say yes to this, we're only going to see a growth in demand. And then add to that geopolitical situ the geopolitical situation, which is telling us, hey, look, not only do we need this because demand is growing, but how about we go find sources of uranium in stable or friendly jurisdictions? And again, that is something that, that Labrador can do. And we think there's that opportunity. So now we're going to get into the guts of the actual project itself. So the central mineral belt itself, it is globally significant. There are dozens and dozens of uranium, copper, gold occurrences throughout this belt. The belt itself is about 260 kilometers long. We have about 125 kilometers of that, and that's the juice of the area where everyone was focused in the last uranium cycle on finding uranium. Um, it is the junction, it, it overlies the junction of four major geological provinces. And, and over history, there's been actually four different orogenic or mountain building phases in this area. That has given us two great gifts. One are the different magmatic events, which bring all those fluids that bring the gold, the copper and all that up to surface that allow us to, to that create those giant deposits. Um, but also that faulting and folding has created the structure needed for things like uranium, which can be a relatively volatile element and, and, and likes to disappear on you. You need to create traps. There need to be traps around to, 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 to allow a deposit to occur. And that we have here, so we have this beautiful situation of all sorts of minerals have come in here and the traps. And we know this works, starting with the fact that at Morin Lake, we already have a historical resource. But on the eastern end of this land package, there's this 100 plus million pound deposit as well. So it is mineral rich, lots of stuff that's come into it. The traps are there. And again, it comes back to we need to find the best targets and to turn this into something very exciting. This is the land package, our main land package. There's a secondary project I'll talk about near the end of this presentation called Natakwanon. But everything on this slide here is, is, the majority, is, is, is the guts of our central mineral belt project. So it lies over about 125 kilometers. Everything in color there is now our project. On the, so if you look at the east end of the deposit over here, this is the Michelin deposit. So that's owned by Paladin. It's about 120 million pounds of uranium sitting at surface. Um, and although it's a very attractive project, they're in the midst of building their Langer Heinrich project and getting that up and running in, in Namibia. So they haven't been able to focus here, but we do believe like both the size and grade here are quite similar to what they're doing there. So it's interesting to see what they're gonna do here. Over here on the, on the, the Western side where I'm circling, that's our Morin Lake project. So Morin Lake is a historic, has a historical geological resource sitting on it. It's, it's both uranium and vanadium at surface. And you'll notice all these black dots. And if you'll see this trend in here of all these black, all the black dots are known uranium occurrences. So there's no doubt that the fluids are there, that the uranium is there. Now we have to piece this together to put together a great deposit. So here's our, the, over here is the, is the uh, as I said over here, that's Morin Lake. The Michelin deposit, which, we're, which we will be getting from mega uranium is this green thing in here. And it's hit over nine meters of uranium at depth in rocks that look very similar to what is in the Michelin deposit. So we have, you know, known drill target here and here, a historical resource that can be drilled out here by the Morin Lake, and then all sorts of occurrences in the in-between where we know there's copper, uh, uranium, gold. So, so it's a really exciting opportunity that I can't wait to get my hands in on. This slide, I won't dwell on a lot, but again, it's just back to the point that I was making before. Every one of these white rectangles points to a known uranium occurrence, including known deposits, right? So Michelin, known deposit. Jacques Lake, known deposit. Mustang Lake, which is gonna be ours very soon. We've hit drill intercepts in there. And then you've got the whole Morin Lake project, which again has historical resources. So it's, 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 there's a lot to do here. And now our job is to make those discoveries. What I also like to point out, though, is it's 
even though we have amazing potential within uranium, historical resource, lots of findings, lots of showings, many areas to follow up and these great trends to go on. There's a lot more in this area. So over 50 years of data have been compiled here, which we now own. And looking at from, you know, your, your gravity and your magnetics and geophysics to till and sediment sampling, we've been able to come up with, and with some of our partners, targets to, to sort of further develop. And, and what's also interesting is it's not just uranium. So the black, the, the green dots on this map, those are all known uranium occurrences or uranium deposits, but the red dots are all known copper occurrences. There's a lot of juice here. And if, again, if you look here, just Northeast of, 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 of the Morin Lake deposit, there's all sorts of uranium and copper. And then just south of that, all these copper findings. And most of that copper work is very early stage. Almost none of it's been drilled. It was mostly surficial by prospectors in the 70s and 80s without that professional follow-up. We layer in the fact that we've got guys who are experts and geologists, but experts in machine learning. And we're looking at all of this historical data that we're referring to in, the, in, in here to come up with our own models to find better targets. And what makes that exciting is in the first pass, when Altius had these just before we took it on, in their first pass, they came up with 146 exploration targets on this land package. That to me is both exciting and a little bit ludicrous. If you want to become a real company, you can't be chasing 140 plus targets, but it does prove, and we do know that there's a lot of, of there are many things in the system. It's a very rich system. So now our job is to, as, as I keep referring to, and I, and I referred to earlier, is use this modern data focused approach to synthesize that data, get great geologists like Paul and Drew and the field team we have, learning how to feed that information into the system and then how to teach that computer, that system on how to make those discoveries. And again, because we've already got a historical deposit at Morin Lake, and because again, Paladin has that deposit at Michelin, we can teach the machine and what are those things that come with the deposit, indicator minerals, what types of geophysics or structures or whatnot, such that from a very high level, and again, the first group tone, all this land, we can start to look at where are these larger potential targets that we want to go after. And that is a big part of what we're doing. So we've got this machine learning approach using all the historical data, looking at this massive land package to come up with the best targets we can, looking for those huge opportunities. And in the meantime, we still have known targets that we can grow. So Morin Lake already has an existing resource. It has, you know, it has uranium that comes straight up to surface, right? There's the uranium here and vanadium. We We've proven this out as a resource. The previous owners have spent $25 million here to, to, to show that we've got it. Now we, now we need to grow it. If you recall on some of my past slides, there was that sort of northeast, southwest trend of uranium occurrences in and around Warren Lake. So our goal is how big can this become? Can we be the next Aurora or, or Paladin that whereby when, when they start off with a similar land package, as they drilled, it kept growing and growing and growing to get it to the point of being a, a, a significant target, a significant project globally. And that is our goal with Morin Lake and, and, and then after Morin Lake with, with the Mustang Lake project with, uh, that we're getting from Mega. So nice thing with Mustang Lake is we know the uranium's there. It has been intercepted over nine meters at depth and in pretty good grades, like 0.12%. Um, the ge geologically, it looks very similar there's two different horizons in it. One looks very similar to what you're seeing at the Michelin deposit. Another looks very similar to what you're seeing at the Jacques Lake deposit. So the rocks are there, the, the ore is there, and now it needs a, you know, it needs a professional program, the proper spend to go out and grow this, hopefully, into a proper resource. So we have a lot of ways to drive value. So we've got drill-ready targets now along the CMB where you know there's uranium, you know there's a resource to grow plus this massive land package that allows us to, to do all sorts of things with it uh, and to make even bigger, more exciting discoveries. Because again, for the first time, this being in one set of hands allows us to come at this from a different approach. When you only have a small little parcel of land, you just got to find what's there. Well, we don't. We can find, you know, is there something bigger? Is there something more exciting that we can go after? And, 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 that's, and that's what we get to do with this land package. And we believe that we could do exactly what Aurora Energy did. And hopefully we can do it multiple times because we have the targets. But when they started their company, 
you know, as we start, we're sitting on about a 20 million pound historical uranium vanadium deposit at Warren Lake. When Aurora started, they were at about 30 million pounds. One of the discoverers of that deposit was Altius, and they owned a big piece of that company. And it's the same with us. And as so two things happen as they start to explore us. First, as you can see on, on, on the on the on the right hand side here, uranium prices are going up. So you can see the uranium price ticking up, right? So obviously that's going to help their market cap. At the same time, as that uranium price was ticking up, every drill campaign they did, they kept hitting and hitting and hitting. So they kept growing this resource out. This thing peaked at about 1.3 billion in market cap. And we think, and that's our goal. That's what we're trying to do. Let's grow these resources, get to that in this price environment. But even more interesting in this model is as uranium prices ticked down, obviously so did their share price, but this is what I always find fascinating. So at a time when uranium prices are falling out of bed and at a time when over a short period of time, this actual, this region in Labrador had a moratorium on uranium exploration, that's gone. And I'm happy to answer questions about that. It's, it's, that's not an issue anymore. Um, but even when there was a moratorium on uranium and uranium prices had gone down, Paladin bought this asset for $261 million. So we, like, it's very real. It's very good. And we think there's multiples of these, hoping at least that there's multiples of these in this area. And our goal is to now go and, and bring those to light. So that's the central mineral belt. That's the central mineral belt, dozens of targets, plus Morin Lake, plus Mustang Lake. We have a lot to do there. Now we're very well funded to do it. Um, there is a final piece to the puzzle, though, which is this Natakwanon project. It's a very new discovery. No one's ever talked about it before us. Altius made this discovery in the last few years. It's a totally different region, a totally different model. So the central mineral belt, if you see this star here, says the Michelin deposit. The central mineral belt's down here, okay? And that's seen exploration since the 70s. Natakwanon up here, uh, by point of reference, this is the Voises Bay Mine up here. Um, this is completely new, different geological setting, uh, never been really drilled or anything before. And what's exciting is this, is in the first passes that the Altius guys did, they found 22 uranium occurrences at surface. You can actually see the uraninite veins come, uh, like you see here on this picture, they come to surface. You can map them, you can trace them there. Um, and we, we've got the, the works and the guts of something that looks very, very exciting. You get grab samples of up to three and a half percent U308, trenches of almost half a percent U308. So we don't know what this is yet. It hasn't been drilled. It hasn't had a lot of major work. But what we do know is there's a lot of uranium in the system. We've locked up the entire area and anything that looks like it could have uranium in it. And the next, really the only next phase, not only next phase, the main next phase is to get in there with drill holes and to figure out how this looks in three dimensions and other and underground. But what's also exciting here is it is different. So if we look down south at what's happening in the central mineral belt, it's mostly sedimentary derived uranium. It's structurally controlled mostly in these shear zones and whatnot, but it's relatively low grade. So the, the, the Michelin deposits a little over 800 PPM in the, in the Morin Lake, you're looking at 350 ppm. Look, there's mines that operate in the world at those grades, but those aren't your Saskatchewan sort of plus 1% grades. And it's a different environment. But up here, this looks more, again, we don't know what it is yet, but it looks much more similar to what you see. There's a basement style um, um, deposit. It comes to surface. It's got there. So we don't know what this is. Um, I'm not saying those grab samples, and I want to be very careful when you see grab samples like three and a half percent, people go screaming, saying how awesome it is. Uranium concentrates in different ways. We're not claiming that that's what we're going to find underground, but we know the uranium's here. We know there's lots of it in the system. And now our job is to drill this and to prove what this can become. So, so really, guys, in a nutshell, that's it. it is, is over the last year, we put this asset package together. We generated the 400, first 146 style targets and IOCGs and, and uranium targets. Um, we got out there even before we owned the assets. We spent almost a million dollars with like helicopter crews and teams getting out there and sampling some of this work. And now we have to build the company forward. So over the next few months, we'll have an updated 43101, which will include all that new land in the CMB to talk about what the potential in geology is. Um, we are looking at all of that historical data and using the machine learning to come up with 
critical targets outside of where we know we're drilling. So we know we're drilling with Notokwana. We know we're drilling more in Lake. But where are these monsters that haven't been found before because no one had consolidated this land? And that's one of the areas we're looking for. Uh, and, and with that machine learning, we want to grow this resource out in and around Warren Lake. So we're in the middle of permitting our field camps. It looks like we'll probably build two field camps this season, which will allow us to continually drill and, and explore over the next few years. Um, we will be drilling this summer on at least two of our projects. Um, and then we keep growing. So, you know, as we said, as I said earlier, we announced a, an $8 million private placement that should close tomorrow. So we're really well capitalized. Um, we will be closing the mega uranium acquisition, the, the, well, the acquisition of the, of the Mustang Lake joint venture. Um, that's in progress and there's no, we don't foresee any hurdles there. Um, yes, we are listed on the, on the Canadian Securities Exchange. We're also trading in, in Germany. And in the next week or two, we expect to be up and trading on the OTC markets in the US. So it's a great investor base. Um, and, 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 and really that's, that's it. So, so look, we are a district scale opportunity. It is a well-known multi-commodity metal belt. Um, and we know there's deposits in here and there's a lot of, 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 of there's a lot here and we need to go find it. We do start with a historical resource base, which is great because that underpins our starter value. And we know there's all sorts of stuff in and around there. So that's one of the easiest, hopefully, and we're exploring still, areas to sort of grow and underpin that value and, and, and grow what we're doing. Um, we have an incredible investor base, both from the retail and institutional side. Both financings were underpinned by significant long-term institutional investors. Um, and, then, and then we've got a great team. The explore, their exploration and geological team has deep experience in Labrador and in making discoveries. Uh, we've got a board of directors that has built companies before whose job it is to keep me honest and keep me on track. Um, and so now our job is to put, put the money in the ground and, uh, and hopefully make some significant dis discoveries. And, uh, and that's really it. So look, I'm going to turn this back over to, to David and you guys to ask some questions, but uh, thank you for your time in the meantime, but that's, uh, that's us at Labrador Uranium. Great. Thank you very much, Stephen. Great presentation. So uh, now we're going to kick off the Q&A portion of the webinar. So a reminder, everybody online, type your questions into the chat box. We'll get to as many as we can. So, um, Stephen, you know, the Central Mineral Belt, other properties leave you with such a massive uh, property package here. And as, a, as you said, it's the first time in, uh, in hands of one company. Now, you talked a little bit about wanting to use artificial intelligence to help prioritize targets, use a modern data approach. But, you know, how do you decide which stage of focus to focus, uh, which stage of project to focus on? You know, you've got resources, you can delineate, you can expand zones, you can still look for new discoveries. You know, that that's more of a corporate strategic decision. How do you how do you make those decisions? Look, it's it's they are complicated decisions, you know, and 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 that's where you want a really good brain trust, both at the geological level and at the board level. You know, I, I had a moment with my team about two months ago where as we were bringing them on and growing the company, I kept telling them what our vision was and what our strategy was. And I, I turned around and I said, OK, great. Now stop and you guys go back and tell me what we should be doing, because I'm a geological engineer. I'm not an exploration geologist. So you should. You shouldn't be listening to me to say, how should I be doing the exploration? And so we're going to take the lead from those guys and where best to explore. But to be more specific, we, we do look at it as a sort of a, it's three pieces. And obviously, as we get results and do the work, you know, there will be, there will be decision making points as to walk away or spend more and that sort of thing. But you um, starting at more in like look, having a historical resource and it's got two commodities, right? It's got the vanadium and the, and the uranium, which are both high demand commodities. Um, with all the information around it, the, it's, it's kind of your low hanging fruit, right? If you can build a real deposit moving towards a hundred million pounds, that is a game changer for any company our size. So that is where a lot of that initial money is going to go. But at the same time we are, and, and, and I know this sounds promotional. I'm not promising this is what we're doing, but my arm waving segment is we are trying to look for that billion dollar style deposit. And so at the machine learning at the front end, is not going to cost us a lot of money because it's mostly the, the 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 brain power of the guys we have on the team and 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 the the technology itself, which actually is not very expensive. Um, but as we gain data and and those experts feed the data and train the machine, um, 
it's about what, for lack of a better term, pops out of that. If we see the potential of these massive deposits, then yeah, we've got to start drilling some of that. And some of this financing we've done does give us some buffer for getting more drill holes in the ground to test some of those. And then it becomes a matter of where the best value is, right? Let's say we're able to grow more in Lake and we do make a discovery in the CMB. Then what we do, we, we have to make that decision then because one of the things to realize about the CMB is we expect to find uranium, but we also expect to find a hell of a lot of copper and gold in that region as well. Um, and those are decisions you make then. Step one, let's see what we can find. Um, it does mean we have to distribute that money across a few more projects. And in the early stages, that's OK. Um, you don't want to see a company doing that over 10 or 20 years because you're never bringing a project to development. Right. And that is, in the end, the only way we make long term money for our shareholders is to prove out a real project. So so we will have to do a little bit of both. I don't know how direct an answer that is, David, but it's kind of it's an iterative progress process. Uh, it will be led by the geologist, but it starts broad. But I think we'll pick some winners out of that in the meantime. Yeah, some some companies have uh, have have success doing all three at the same time. And, and I'm sure once you get more familiar with the property, uh, you'll have a pipeline of, of targets that you get. Yeah, it's a matter of feeling out the geos and seeing what excites them the most, right? Like what excites me versus them could be two very different things. But uh, right now they're pretty pumped to get out there and, and see what we have. Right, right. Okay. Um, since we're on the topic of Moran Lake here, you know, there is a considerable vanadium component to this asset. You know, if I remember correctly, it's a it's a 10 million pounds of uranium, but that increases two or three fold when converting to uranium equivalent. Do you know if the vanadium is an intimately associated, associated with the uranium and that's really why it's found? Or is there opportunity to really expand the vanadium considerably? you know, vanadium only mineralization. Is that something that's in, uh, interesting to you? It is interesting to me. They, 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 if you look at the resource statement, they're actually separated out because there are some of the rocks that are just vanadium. They do occur within the same sort of body, but it's, it, you, there's different layers here. Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, I, although our name is, is Labrador uranium and uranium is our focus. And there's a hell of a lot of it here. Um, um our overall philosophy, and it's fairly simplistic, is our job is to make shareholders money. So if we put a hole in something that ends up being some massive copper gold deposit that looks like it's the billion dollar deposit, it is ignorant of us to ignore that. Um, they're still relatively strategic metals. The nice thing is with the thesis of energy and clean energy going towards the future, I can talk to you all day long about why that works for uranium. But we can talk about copper and vanadium in that exact same conversation um and so i think we would continue continue to do that as well um and i think there's great value and if you look at sort of the, the other thing to consider in this in this basin is or in this belt is so far within the central mineral belt we're not looking at one percent uranium grades right we're looking at three five eight hundred ppm um those can be difficult to mine from an economic point of view obviously with the more pounds you get the easier it is but the more other commodities and minerals you can get within those deposits that pay, as long as you can extract them, right? We're not playing a game of pretending like you got to be able to actually get something out of it. Um, that's just straight value to you. Either you can either consider it lowering your cost or increasing your revenue, but all either way you win. Right, right. And, and from still on Moran, uh, when do you expect to announce the resource estimate? And is this really just uh, turning this historic resource to something compliant? Or are you able to upgrade something here without with limited field work? Uh, with limited field work, we won't be increasing any resource like the first 43101 that should be coming out the next month is basically what we saw for consolidated uranium on Moran Lake, but adding in and layering in the entire central mineral belt what that looks like and understanding that. Uh, from our point of view of growing more and like, look, we're, we're a little while away from expanding that resource. As I've told the team, um, our job right now with more and like is, uh, we have no interest in just take, changing a historical resource to an inferred resource, because if it does not grow, then it's not a mine. At 20 million pounds uranium equivalent, that's not a mine um, and we don't care. So. What we do need to do is, yes, we will do some infill to sort of bring the data up. But in the end, the main goal is to expand that resource and see if we do have the 
hundred million pound deposit. So that is the goal. And, and so the drilling is some of, there will be some of the, of the infill, but most of that will hopefully be based on trying to grow, grow this into it. Right. I, I don't believe in, in science projects. I believe in, you know, is there something economic there? So you drill it. If it doesn't work, you move on. We've got a lot of targets. If it does work great. So the goal is to expand it. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, your 2007 price chart for Aurora really brings me back. You know, that was the first, very first uranium company I picked up in 2007 when I converted from gold to, to uranium uh, analysts for full time. Um, the, the Mustang Lake project is pretty close to those assets. Uh, and maybe I want to clarify something here based on a question. You know, the, this is an acquisition from Mega. You are not acquiring Mega. Correct. Yeah. So, so yeah, I saw that question up here on the side. I might have misspoken. We're, we're buying their Mustang Lake joint venture. They have two thirds of a joint of, of that asset and we're buying that from them. So just just to be clear. Um, OK. Is, is, but, is there any desire to pick up the other one third from the, the, the remaining uh, interest from someone else? Yeah. I, 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 in truth, uh, I shouldn't say this out loud, but, you know, look, a lot of those deals have to do with diluting guys down. We're going to if we spend the money, the other guys are going to be diluted down unless they show up with the money. If they want to participate, great. If if not, I'm happy to dilute them down and, and, and take them somewhere from there. Uh, right. So there's no need yet. Look, we've we've we just bought a lot of land, a lot of projects, and we've really got to focus on that. Um, it is an exciting target in that they've they've drilled it and and, and hit. Um, it is more complicated in that the best place to drill from there is is the lake. So that's winter drilling, which is great because. We got our summer drill program. Now we already know where we can go in the winter um, and just follow up those holes. But it would be great to grow that into something significant. Um, it's not, you know, we do like it. We will work it, but it's not our number one target. Probably not even our number two target. But, you know, nine meters of 0.12%, I think I said, is is uh, that's pretty attractive to me, right? Like if you're looking at, 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 yeah. at that, that's even higher grade than what you got at Michelin, I'd, I'd look at that all day long. Yeah, uh, that's exactly what I was going to say. That's pretty good grade for those felsic intermediate uh, d deposits, you know, like Jacques Lake or Michelin. You know, neither of those are are that high grade, but you know, the the off, you know, these are fairly consistent and they are fairly large. So, I, hence the uh, the attraction. So, what what are your plans for the property? Do you plan to follow up on that intercept? Uh, yeah, well, something. step one, let's get the ownership. We're closing that up now. I don't know. I don't have a view on the timing, but that should be relatively soon. Um, that's and that's not a the slowing down of that is not an issue of anything other than sometimes just dotting the I's and crossing the T's takes its time on the due diligence side. Um, the so this year, the odds of much being done there in 2022 are fairly low. Um, we will, you know, we'll, we'll do some line cutting, get guys ready, maybe do some ground geophysics, but that'll be the, I think, I think we'll probably try to get a drill on there in, in, in the winter campaign, sort of January, February. I'd love to follow up some of those holes. We know the final hole they did there ended in mineralization and then they lost it. So haven't gone back in. So there's, there's some work that has not been completed that we would love to follow up. Right. Okay. Um, moving on to Nataquanon, you know, that appears to be different, you know, some maybe higher grade multi-percent uranium, although grab samples can be biased, you know, yep. not in the same location as everything else, you know, how, uh, you know, but it, but it might be drill ready, you know, how much focus are you going to put on that project this year? So, you know, there's, there's quite a bit more to do, but in the end, one of the things we talked about as a team is, because of that surface, you can map it. We have the occurrences. Uh, we will drill that permits permitting, which we're not expecting any issues with. We will drill that in 2022. That's not resource drilling at this point, right? Nothing's ever been really done here. So how does it hold together in three dimensions? What do those veins start looking like? Um, but I would expect to probably put 2000 meters of drilling in and around that area to see how it holds together. Okay. And now you might have, uh, you know, offhandedly answered this question, but this is more about the CMB project, you know, with uranium, obviously, obviously your focus, but if other opportunities present themselves, would you pivot to look for copper, for vanadium, for IOCG? I'm not sure I'd call it pivot, um, but if I make a big copper, uranium, or IOC, uh, copper, vanadium, or IOCG target, we will, we will run it to ground, right? We will keep working it. Our number one focus has to be the uranium. But if you find some giant IOCG, then 
<clears throat> then we have decisions to make. You know, if it's IOCG, they often come with uranium. That, that stays strategic. It's one you want and what your investors want. If you make a giant copper target, the copper discovery, um, then you want to, you know, you want to get it to a certain point. But yeah, maybe you do spin it out. You create another company. You always want to do things in a manner that you you benefit your shareholders. Um, I find multi-commodity plays don't always get a, you, 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 you get a premium on one thing and you lose it on the other. So you want to make sure that, that you allow for the proper growth, just like what consolidated did with Sasset. The more like look good and has value, but they weren't going to be able to spend the time and money. So do we do the same thing with, with what we're doing? And I think the answer is yes. So we, we have a philosophy here. We will ignore nothing. If it looks like a great deposit, we will try to prove it up. Um, but you don't, as of yet, like let's say it's a copper deposit or copper target, you can't use all your uranium money to find that and to develop. So you get to a certain point where the spend, you might want to spend that in another vehicle. But those are decisions we make then. We're not there yet, but we're fundamentally, we will not ignore it. Right, right. And luckily, these are all the critical elements that are included in the, the, the latest budget in Canada. So good. Exactly. Um, Actually, yeah, almost everything we touch in this region looks like it'll yeah. be within that. So, great, great. Uh, what's your current expiration budget uh, for this year? And with this equity raise, you're you're closing now. Uh, can you cover it? And and I guess does that get you drilling? And when might we see assays? Okay, so the, the the budget question I'll give you sort of two answers for because obviously we had a plan before doing the financing, and now we're sort of revising that plan. And none of this has been. No, so none of this is official. So, so, you know, take this for what it is. But in the end, I expect that in 2022, at very first blush, there's a minimum of six and a half million dollars that we will spend in the ground. Um, that will include drilling both at Morin Lake and at the Taquanon. And it will, it also includes the construction of two field camps because it's all fly in, fly out. Weather can be an issue. You want field camps. So we'll build one, sorry, up in the Taquanon. We'll build one. In a, in, a, in a central location, the central mineral belt, um, the the plus or minus 10 million that this financing should be bringing in um, will give us, well, A, it fully funds that, but it also really allows us to do two things. One is what we didn't budget for is with the machine learning, if we come up with great targets, we weren't going to be able to drill that just yet. So maybe this gives us the ability to stick a drill hole or two in one of these key targets. But secondly, it really allows us to focus on what we can do in winter 2023. One of the things to realize in Labrador is you can drill, you can do field exploration in the summer and the winter. Fall and spring, you're really not doing much. Um, winter, obviously, is going to be more focused on, on drilling. But because there's so many lakes and whatnot, like at Mustang Lake, your best place to drill from is going to be a lake. Right? Once it's frozen over, you can do that. So to answer the broader question, yeah, this allows us to do everything we wanted to do this year, plus go into the next season and add some additional, like if we see something exciting out there, as long as the resources are available, then, then we can go after it. The, the final piece to your question is harder to answer, which is assays. So um, anybody who's been following the exploration space in, in Newfoundland and Labrador, um, Getting assays back has been really difficult. There are certain companies that are three, four months in waiting for assays. Now we're trying to do things to allow us to get the front of some of those lines. The, the, it seems like the key is less about the assay lab than about the prep lab. So we do know that there's one or two new prep labs being sent, um, but we expect to be drilling in July and August. You know, in a, in a real ideal world, I'd love to see results in September, October. Some of that I don't have control over. Um, and if any of you on this call know any good assay labs, feel free to lean on them and get guys moving more quickly. Great, great. Yeah, labs certainly overworked and slow, and uh, certainly weather can be an issue as well. I spent about 10 hours waiting in the fog trying to get to site there about uh, 12 or 13 years ago. So. Um, just, uh, I guess, a last uh, question about the assets. You know, can you can you maybe discuss the extent of your leverage to uranium prices, considering you've got in situ resources? Not really. <laughs> um, look, as 
as a uranium explorer, like first and foremost, I don't believe, and I could be wrong, and David, you're much smarter on this than I am. I don't think people are going to give us a ton of value for our uranium resource. I think it's a good starter kit. And from a comparable company's perspective, it allows us to put our hands nicely around it and say there's a value. Um, that being said, though, I think every pound in the ground that we find will just move our share price up, especially with uranium price going up. Right. Look, if uranium price drops out of bed, there's there's not a lot we can do. Like hopefully the copper and the vanadium will be more forgiving. Um, but I think much like what the, 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 the Aurora guys did is is in an upwardly moving uranium price scenario, which I do expect in the next over the next two to four years. Um, every pound is just going to, it's going to just accelerate what our value is and, gr and grow it significantly. That's not a very sophisticated answer though. Mm -hmm. No, I, and I think I agree with you. You know, resources actually put you in a different bracket than say a grassroots explorer. You know, there's underlying value, whether it's from, you know, a key project, a non-key project or, you know, vanadium as opposed to uranium. So it's uh, like you said, sort of a starter kit there. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and, and we've got to do something with it. So, like again, as you saw that chart, I think if, if, the, if the prices keep increasing and we make discoveries, everything is going to be very, very good. This is a region, and, and I'm not to not to like put a bullet in my own head, but the nature of the grades in this region and this is we need size, so we do need to add pounds in the ground to make this work. Um, but you know, the more uranium price grows, the the easier that is for us. I think for me, uh, you know, in anything. You know, Anything sort of above fifty dollars gets us gets us economic pounds in the ground as long as you don't go too deep. And we're not exploring deep for the uranium. We're not at these grades. We're not doing these massive deep holes. We're trying like we do know. For example, Morin Lake grows at depth. We know it's open. There's no point in chasing that at depth at three hundred and fifty ppm because you're not going to mine that. So you've got to grow it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, can you discuss local support? You know, either from the government or social license from uh, local communities. Yeah, so look, that's a it's a two way street with local support. With local support, you also have to become part of the community, and that's a very important thing that we look at. So um, we're already on the ground. I'm actually out there in a week meeting with uh, the different communities of Makovic, Postville, Nain, Goose Bay, um, and the different the First Nations do have self government in that area, and that's something we are working on. Um, from a, a we'll start at the provincial government level. Very supportive. Uh, local and provincial groups really are mining friendly. Um, they want us working in this region. The closest local community of Postville, like the mayor, we've been, we've talked to them. They really like to see growth here. Um, the first deals we're signing there, the first significant contracts we'll be entering into are going to be obviously our drilling and helicopter contracts. Those are going to be the most significant part of our spend. Both of those are with groups that are co-owned co by local and indigenous communities. So that is going to be very important. The, the from a government, again, from a government regulatory perspective, it is an amazing place to work. Um, from a First Nations perspective, like anywhere else, you just have to uh, you have to be intelligent about it. So, in the CMB, falls mostly within land claims of the Nunat Siavik government. So, the, the Inuit have their own self government in that region. Uh, I alluded earlier to the fact that back in the day, there was a moratorium on uranium exploration. That was only put in place while the Nunat Siavik government was figuring itself out. Now that they've set themselves up, they allow for uranium exploration. They've got the processes to, to allow you to, to do this and they're not getting away at all. Um, but as we, any mine globally, you know, as much as we all, and I'm a mining guy, I love it. I can tell you all the great things about it. Any local community, any indigenous community is going to have its issues, especially when you put the word uranium in front of it. Um, as of right now, nothing has shut us down or slow us down, but but it is something we are conscious of. And, and fundamentally, we have to become a part of those communities and spend time and get people comfortable. And that will involve hiring locally, using local contractors, spending time in the communities, and then bringing people out to site and teaching them about what we're doing. It will take time. But right now, from a permitting perspective, there are no issues. Uh, from a government regulatory perspective, it's been terrific. 
Great. No, I agree there. I think that ban was really a function of the increased volume of work in the area at the time. They uh, wanted to have a policy. They got the policy. The ban was lifted. Uh, you know, sort of similar to what you're seeing in the Athabasca right now. You know, you, you see roadblocks, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, those are people that want the uh, want the jobs and want the uranium mines, and they have signed deals with the companies that are going to going to bring them forward. So, yeah. so it's, uh, well, don't yeah. don't make it a whodunit novel. Don't show up on the last day saying, hey, I want to build a mine. You got to start the very first day. Mm -hmm. um, and it does take time and it does take trust. You see in places like Quebec, certain groups will just shut down a project from the very outset because they've been, you know, treated poorly in the past or had bad communication in the past. And we have to just accept that people might fight these things. We don't have that here where we are, but you have to ex assume that that's going to happen and then approach it openly and figure out how do we get this done? And, and, and I think there's solutions to all of this, but it all involves going through the front door and working with the communities. Right. Okay. Uh, just a couple more questions before we have to sign off here. Uh, you know, Labrador was uh, spun out of consolidated uranium, as we all know. Do you know how well aligned you've been with the consolidated shareholders? How how well have they held the stock now that you've gone public? It's a very good question. I don't. I don't. To tell you the truth, I can say. I can say this though. Like um, in our initial financing, there were a lot of the consolidated guys that played. So although they were already getting consolid our, our shares through the spin out. They still played and invested in us, so that was good support. Um, it has there has been good liquidity in the markets, but we haven't seen any icebergs of massive amounts coming out and, and selling. We we have the advantage that our executive chairman is the CEO of Consolidated, uh, Phil Williams. He's pretty close with his shareholders, communicates with them, and as yet, I haven't heard anything. I think you know, there's always when you when you spin something out and you get point X shares per share that you own. If you end up with 18 shares. Yeah, guys like that will sell, but we haven't seen any blowback, and and so far, so far so good. I, I, I uh, you know, we're we're trying to spend, you know, in, in this time between now and actually getting the drill rigs going. A big part of what I've been doing over the last few months has just been getting out there and talking to investors, answering questions, and to figure out how people feel. Because now that you're public, you got to be out there and figure out what people want. So it's not the greatest answer, but that's that's what I got, David. Yeah, no worries. So uh, I guess let's wrap it up here. You know, the, the OTC listing is coming, so uh, probably more U.S. retail investment. Uh, have you seen much buying from uranium funds or ETFs this year since going public? Um, we've definitely seen, well, again, so both the financings were taken down by, by the uranium funds. I think we're probably small for the ETFs. I haven't actually confirmed. That's a good question. I should check out the ETF side. But we've talked to a few, but... If I'm right, I think we're probably a little small and early for most of those guys. Um, so you got to be realistic there. Um, if you look at the size of the blocks that are moving, they're not big enough probably for there to be large institutions buying, right? If you're averaging 200,000 shares a day kind of thing, that's not going to be big enough. But uh, we have happily on the other side, out in the private placements, we're really well subscribed with by those guys. And, and we haven't seen a lot of that coming back. I think the only time we saw flow back was uh, the end of the quarter. So the end of the quarter, there is definitely, we figured out pretty quickly, there was one fund that that did did come out at the end of the quarter. I think they got most of theirs through consolidated. And, and look, if you have to mark to market and you're a public fund, that's what you got to do. And uh, part of my job is to make sure that uh, the other guys have the confidence to stay with us. But I think, I think we've got, a, I think we have good support. Great. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, Keith. Uh, we certainly covered a lot of ground in that call. Uh, appreciate uh, you spending time with us today. Look, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the time and the opportunity, David, and for everybody else on the call. Um, and look, part of what I do is is my job is to answer questions and concerns. And if, if people have further questions or, or want to reach out, please feel free. We're always available. Great. Thanks to everybody else for tuning in. Red Cloud Securities will be back next Tuesday afternoon. I will sit down with Anfield Energy. So that's May 3rd at 2 p.m. Eastern. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.